marks the second anniversary of IHUB data and it also coincides with the Silver Jubilee of IIIT Hyderabad. It is our proud privilege to offer to you the symposium on data-driven deep disruptions at IIIT Hyderabad. International Institute of Information Technology Hyderabad is an autonomous university founded as a not-for-profit public-private partnership in 1998 and is the first IIIT in India under this model. Over the years, the institute has evolved strong research programs at undergraduate level with an emphasis on technology and applied research for industry and society. IHUB Data is a technology innovation IHUB for data banks, data services, and data analytics established by International Institute of Information Technology, Hyderabad, under the national mission on interdisciplinary cyber physical system scheme. IHUB manages the Data Foundation, Research and Technology Development, Applied Research and Translation, HRD and Skill Development, Innovation and Startups, and the international collaborations to strengthen some of the core objectives and goals of IIIT Hyderabad. Please enjoy participating in this symposium. I would now like to introduce to you Dr. C.K. Raju sir. Dr. C.K. Raju sir has been working as a lead faculty of skill development courses in IHUB Data, IIIT Hyderabad since one and a half year. He has done his PhD in National Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, and Masters of Science in Bitspilani. I would like, uh, now like to in invite Professor C.K. Raju sir to introduce to you the president of this inaugural function, Professor Deva Priyakumar sir. Thank you, Lashmi. <clears throat> so Lashmi is our uh, heading the uh, career uh, careers portfolio. And uh, we all know in Indian mythology, Lashmi is the goddess of uh, prosperity and wealth. So uh, it's a very auspicious uh, day for all of us. And I welcome all of you uh, who have come here from far uh, to uh, be part of this uh, three-day symposium. Have a nice uh, few days uh, ahead. So let me now move on. <clears throat> we have three uh, great uh, people, three giants in their fields uh, who are here to, uh, to inaugurate this uh, three-day symposium. Uh, Professor Deva Priyakumar he is the head of uh, IHUB data, and he's, he has received his uh, PhD from Pondicherry University and Indian Institute of uh, Chemical Technology. <clears throat> he had a postdoctoral fellowship of University of Maryland at uh, Baltimore, US. He's the professor and head of uh, the Center for Computational Natural Sciences and Bioinformatics here at uh, IIIT. Uh, for his uh, contributions, uh, Professor Deva has been recipient of many awards. A few of them are, uh, he has received the award in chemical from the Chemical Research Society of India, from Chemical Society of uh, Japan. He was the, earlier he was the Google Impact, uh, he has also received the Google Impact Scholar Award. He was also the uh, young scientist uh, recipient of the Indian National Science Academy and many other. Okay, so let me now invite uh, Professor Deva Prekumar to be the president of this function. <laughs> <clears throat> Professor uh, C.V. Jawar is the Dean, and, uh, dean of Research and Development at IIIT Hyderabad. He is also the head of uh, Center for uh, Visual Information Technology and leads a group focusing on computer vision, machine learning, and multimedia. Uh, he is an Amazon chair professor and is also an elected fellow of Indian National Academy of Engineers and International Association of uh, Patent Recognition. He has a large number of uh, publications which people don't count. Uh, and <clears throat> he is extremely, this is what makes Prasa very special, Jawar very special, which is that he is extremely conscious of uh, the social and practical elements of application of uh, the research that takes place here. And he is also actively engaged with several government agencies, ministries, and leading companies in the world innovating at scale through research. Uh, the Association of uh, Computing Machinery, ACM, uh, in recognition of his uh, uh, contributions to teaching has uh, awarded him with the ACM India Outstanding Contribution to Computing Education Award in 2021. May I now invite Professor C. Vichawar to take the <laughs> stage. Our chief guest for this day is uh, Professor Devi Ramaswamy, who was the former head of uh, Philips India. 
He is now <coughs> the CEO of RV Consultants. He advises the global and local healthcare enterprises on strategy growth and diversification diversifications as also on product and product project management. He is on the board of several incubators, startups, and educational institutions. He also coaches and mentors uh, senior leaders in the ecosystem. At Philips, he was the senior director and head health systems at Philips Innovation Camp campus at Bangalore. In addition to this, he also managed a new business creation hub, which interfaces the markets in Australia, Japan, APAC, India, Middle East, uh, Turkey, Africa, and Central Eastern Europe to support their growth ambitions in healthcare solutions. While product development for the developed world was his forte, he is also deeply involved in creating CNFTA certified products and solutions for the underserved segments in emerging geographics. After graduating from VNIT Nagpur in electronics and power engineering, he joined LNT in 82 and later moved to GE in 2000 and then to Philips in 2010. His experience covers uh, research and development, operations, so finance, strategic planning, project management, product management, mergers and acquisition, and general management. He completed his master's in uh, engineering management from NIE Mysore in 1990. In his uh, career spanning four decades, he has spent over 25 years in the healthcare space, evangelizing affordable care. Dr. Ravi has been a task force member of several government committees at the central and state level. He is a regular speaker in inter Indian and international conferences on healthcare. He evangelizes healthcare in the print and digital media. He is a fellow of Institution of in Engineers India, fellow Heat Lab, USA, a senior member IEEE, member of uh, FICI Innovation Subcommittee, member CIA, and chairs the healthcare track for IET in India. Uh, let me now in introduce, uh, inv invite uh, Dr. Evi Ramasandhi on the stage. I now request uh, the president of the function, Dr. Devar, to uh, speak and lead the uh, function. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Raji, for a um, nice introduction and uh, putting together this program. So, you know, first, you know, before I forget, you know, I would like to thank Dr. Raju and also Pawan, who is not here, maybe outside, but for uh, putting this uh, three days program together and then, um, um, you know, making this possible. So I also would like to um, welcome all the guests from outside, the, the panel members, speakers, uh, and also the um, students from other places and other um, companies. Right, so um, what I will do is you know, maybe I will give a short introduction to um, the IHOP data and then uh, mention a few things that we have done in the last um, uh, two years, right? And then, um, you know, hopefully uh, we'll get some feedback and, you know, possible more uh, collaborations and partners working with uh, uh, other um, entities. So IHOP data, we started this about um, two years ago with the mandate of, um, um, you know, coming up with new technologies uh, based on, um, you know, data. Like, you know, we have um, data that is collected, whether from hospitals or mobility-related data, and to develop new technologies that can be productized or that can make a, an impact in the society, right? So, you know, you know initially we had a lot of plans and, um, you know, a lot of brainstorming and, um, you know, especially uh, Professor Jauhar, so he has a very um, clear vision of how this has to be uh, done. And hence, we put together different kinds of verticals where we um, do, for example, the basic research and then data collection and data uh, activities around data um, through something called a data foundation. Um, and then, uh, you know, when you have these new technologies, we develop uh, new products and prototypes that uh, possibly the industry and new startups uh, will use of it or we apply in um, uh, industry. So in addition to this, we also have uh, different programs which uh, Dr. Raju leads. Um, we have, for example, the um, um, courses that we do, like long-term courses that some of you are part of, the um, uh, foundations in modern machine learning uh, methods, and then uh, we also did a course on, um, you know, AI for drug discovery, uh, and then many are in the cards, right? So basically, the idea is to reach out to as many individuals as possible, or as reach out to as many institutes as possible, 
to um, you know bring awareness and um, skill to um, students and other uh, technicians in data driven technologies right whether you know professionals in healthcare or um, you know students who are doing their engineering or they have graduated and they would like to do something and so on so and then this the next thing that we do is to um, uh, train uh, do hands on training and people are part of active research um, projects here right through you know it could be internships it could be masters by research program um, uh, fellowships or phd fellowships postdoc fellowships um, and so on right and also you know now that we are out of covid we will also have um, you know visitors coming in there are a few visitors now but visitors coming in and uh, you know from other colleges or companies and so on spending time with us and then um, be actively part of the efforts that we do or some of the initiatives that we um, do and some initiatives are done by others and we um, you know mentor them and uh, uh, be part of it and so on right so um, so that way um, you know we have a number of opportunities at uh, multiple levels whether you know whether if you are a student or whether you are leading a company or leading an institute you know, we have a spectrum of different activities that many, many, um, you know, um, different um, levels participation could be seeked in this particular activity. So, um, uh, just to quickly mention some of the initiatives that we have done in the last two years, um, you know, we most of our work is in two different verticals. One is in healthcare, second one is in uh, mobility, a smart mobility. So, the smart mobility is an area that we started working um, in maybe around five years ago, but then we expanded um, um, you know, significantly after the iHub uh, started. So this particular area is uh, you know, driven by Professor uh, Jawahar and uh, his large um, team. Some of the things that we did was we have put out the largest um, data set on Indian driving conditions. For example, you know, people talk about autonomous driving right, in the West, right? and that same kind of technologies is not going to work for um, the Indian setting, right? So, you know, instead of thinking of autonomous driving, can we think of, for example, road safety, right? Can, you know, this large number of, um, uh, the, the fatality in the, on the roads in India is a big um, problem, right? So the question is, can we come up with technologies, right, that can reduce the fatality by, let's say, 50% in five years, okay? So in that sense, you know, his uh, team has developed a large number of technologies, including you know, road quality assessment and road surveillance, uh, detection of, um, you know, potholes, for example, and uh, detecting traffic violations, like whether it's signal uh, jumping or, um, you know, helmetless driving or three people ri riding on a motorcycle and so on. So now all that technology that is developed can be used to automatically detect all these things, okay? So in addition to that, there are multiple other projects that um, um, the mobility is uh, mobility team is driving, which I think you will hear in the next uh, two days, some of them, and I, I hope Professor Jawar also may mention some. And the second area is healthcare, where, um, uh, again, um, you know, some initiatives we have uh, started. Um, so one of them is we have established a genomics uh, sequencing lab. Basically, this lab will try and do a disease surveillance or genomic surveillance of, um, you know, infectious diseases like uh, you know, dengue, COVID, and uh, uh, malaria, and so on, right? So, you know, we'll have a large data set of the different kinds of, um, you know, um, uh, the genome, genome sequence of uh, different kinds of organisms and how the mutation happens, in which area it's, you know, spreading more and things like that. And the second area is, again, um, that is being done is uh, in cancer diagnosis, where, um, you know, Dr. Vinod here, he leads the um, you know faster and accurate detection of cancer based on, for example, you know, whole slide images. Right? We have again established a facility here, and then also in uh, um, you know in NIMS uh, Hyderabad campus and so on. And then the other areas that we work are in mental health and neuro and mental health, where Dr. Sujitesh is part of. Um, you know, we are looking at sleep staging and uh, you know, other uh, different kinds of. Um, projects and then we also did a lot of work in um, COVID-19 uh, to you know for example to um, for predicting uh, mortality right you know if somebody is infected with COVID-19 you know how likely or how uh, is that person um, 
um, you know, likely to survive, right? So that kind of work, you know, again, genome-based work and things like that. So um, as I said, you know, basically the idea is that we have, you know, um, we have been doing large amount of data collection in healthcare and mobility and trying to develop uh, technologies, you know, that could be useful in disease detection or improving road safety and so on. So what we aspire to do in the next uh, one or two years is one, of course, to expand, um, you know, different of these different activities. I hope in that sense we will um, have some inputs and more partnerships coming in and uh, you know the next important thing is to take products to the market you know to be able to develop some prototypes and products and so on that actually can make a difference um, in the day-to-day um, -day life right so that's the um, hope hope for the next uh, step so I, I, I hope you know I, I was able to kind of mention a few things in terms of what we have been trying to do and what we aspire to do so with that, I leave you, um, you know, um, you know I, I hope you will have uh, three days of very good uh, learning and uh, um, interactions and so on. So I, I wish you all the best. Thank you very much. Thanks. Okay, so uh, now I would like to invite Professor Jawahar to say a few words. Thank you. Thank you, Deva. Thank you, Raju. Good morning. Ah, there's some. Okay, good, good. These are all living human beings sitting here. Good. So I have a couple of questions before we get, and I want to know the answer for what you understand. That's the primary objective. One, uh, there are two things that you heard. One, uh, I think Professor Raju has been talking about this data-driven disruption. Now, what is this data-driven disruption? Okay, it's a bit tough question, so let me ask an easy question. You might have heard this story or a very popular phrase everywhere now, data is a fuel of what, of uh, the next century, this century, AI, everywhere people use this data is a fuel. What does it mean by data is a fuel? Why is it called data is a fuel? Or data is oil, or whatever the people call it, isn't it? Why is it? What does it mean? You need data to work on anything. So which means like a without fuel, without oil, nothing will work. That's a parallelism. Good, good. That's a one uh, good comparison. So always when you hear a slogan like this, understand how deep could be that analogy. Is there any other analogy that you can have with fuel or oil with uh, data? What is oil? Is it this oil that we apply on our head? No. What is this oil? What is it? Uh -huh. it, is, it is, what is it called? In the market, etc. where do we go? Petrol, diesel, all these things that we do, isn't it? So how they are produced? Hmm? They are extracted by what? Digging some well. Okay, so what is there below this earth then? Hmm? Okay, so how they came? Hmm? What was there? One person, little bit loud. Yeah. Pardon? Export. What does it mean? Bodies exported. What is bodies? Huh? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Very tough, powerful statement. True. So, so one uh, civilization possibly like a left lot of things behind for us to enjoy. That is what data does. You leave data, the residue left so that you can do things on top of it in the future. Or you use such left outs of the previous civilization or 
our friends or our colleagues or our previous generation for building solutions for the next generation. Look at how powerful is this analogy. Which means that, so now why is this available only in certain places? Good to, good to ask, think a little bit. So on one hand, we all create lot, tons and tons of data, isn't it? So when I walk, when I move, when I breathe, when I live every day, every second, every millisecond, microsecond, I am creating data. And everything that you do, type, click, uh, or browse, everything that you are creating data. Every sensor is capturing data. So what is the data that people use? What happens after that? What is really useful? Pardon? Yes, yes, yes. By using the data, we can do that, but not all data gets used. So you also need to have an idea about, yes, you are right. I think it is not that we, we have data. Now we also need to know that what data we need for certain type of application, solving certain problems, etc. in the future. And this requires data to be generated in certain form. Certain type of things will work now. Certain type of things uh, will work uh, without, uh, maybe, maybe, many, after many, 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 many more years with so much of density coming, uh, maybe at some stage, like I, we will also see oil in Hyderabad. But today we don't have. Because environmental factors did not really help us in that. So, so the, the, when do you create data or when you use data, you also ask the question. So sometimes we look at this as a disconnected piece in the, in the conversations I see. So say like I have data, then why problems are not getting solved? Say somebody was asking uh, like a last week to me say that, Javar, you've been talking about like there is no data, there is no data, but there's a lot of data here, why are you not using? It is that sometimes we are not ready to use it. Sometimes we don't know how to use it. Sometimes it is not curated enough how to use it. It is not that data is just some log. You're able to learn from the data because it captures some knowledge of the process, of how the physics and science behind how it was created, or the knowledge of the civilization captured in some form, in encoded in some form in the data, so that you can build AI systems on top of it. It may be an expert, it may be a layman, we put knowledge in along with the data. So this gap sometimes we have to understand. So very often we look at data as a log or data as a dump, like I so my hard disk is full, it is full of data. Does it mean, I, on one hand you are right, your hard disk is full with, uh, with all the movies that you download or watch, uh, like it's okay, but you are, all the photographs that you have taken is full on your mobile phone, it is full of data. But that data, you are not able to use it because you are not, it is not rich enough for you to use it today. So this is exactly similar to the way we say, I can write 10 million lines of Python code by sitting here. If, I, if, I, if it, I can, it, it will not compile, it will not run on my computer, it is of no use to anybody, isn't it? So it has to be in some form that this code, this data that I generated, I need to use it. So there is an eye on how do I use it when you are creating data, when you are using data, when you are curating data, when you are talking about data. That is why the data in its purest raw sense, if you, me if you measure it as a number of bytes or amount of bytes that you have, is of not useful for us. But the moment you connect with the utility, 
the moment you can see a utility so you can have no visibility so for example i want to go from here to like a koti and i start walking with no direction i may not reach there maybe i will reach eventually by doing a random walk but if i have a source like a goal that goal tells me how should i walk the goal tells me i should walk from here to this direction to reach koti but i cannot walk in this direction because there is a like a wall on the way there are buildings on the way i cannot walk what do i do i take a road route which may go this way this way finally take me to the route similarly in the case of data also i have a goal what data i want what that what problem i want to solve i have some vague understanding of what i want so i need to move in this direction so there is a there are two ends here there is a goal there is a goal of solving problems which are very important which will disrupt the world which will the existing setups which will solve important socially relevant problems this is one viewpoint and for that we need data now we may not know how the, how we use this data to reach there today fully if i am able to see the end of the goal so when i if i am able to see from here that the route to the koti koti has to be quite close if you are looking for full visibility to your goal your goal is very near this makes the life difficult so you have to have visibility with no visibility you will be in the dark with full visibility you are looking for extremely low hanging fruits very small achievable goals so you have to be comfortable in thinking how do you live in between these two there is a goal there is a, i have a data so what data i need to curate and how do i take it to this this, this place and that is what today happening in ai space people are creating data people are curating data people are making this data available and this world has changed a lot i don't know how many of you are aware of the history of or at least the recent history of computing if you look at it at one stage we were worried about the softwares that we are writing using building our proprietary there's a strong movement came open source software you might have heard this open source software isn't it today everything is open source it did not meet the goals open source is not enough today it is not the code the knowledge is in the data so people are not today worried about uh, releasing the code publicly not just academia industry everywhere companies companies are investing on uh, commercial big entities will fund a lot of uh, open source activities they are not losing any ip it is a data that is important today the, the, the systematically that entire thing changed now is the data proprietary the next question going to come today if you ever want to disrupt if you ever want to solve problems what is important there is a very well known public trick that people are using today i open source the data what is open sourcing the data makes available what happens after that all of you work on that okay earlier i was limited by my skills my time my computer and everything now with this open sourcing the data i am able to get all of you on board our team has grown we can solve now tougher problems important problems bigger problems
So the way the data is going to disrupt is in many different ways than what you thought. It is going to get people on board. It is going to strengthen the team. It is going to strengthen the team without paying salaries. I conduct a hackathon, all of you will solve, and I just need a single price money which is worth of one person salary for 100 people to work on it. Nice, I, nothing wrong. All, all the, the, the learning is much more. As, as an educationist, I appreciate it because all of you are learning in this entire process. Working on, working on real life problems used to be a, a worry many, many, many years back. Today, that is not a worry. Even today, I see old people still sometimes talk about working on real life problems, etc. I say, look, today, young generation works only on real problems. Why? Because they use the data from Kaggle or similar places. So, situation has changed significantly over the last many years. And we have to appreciate that change. And we are all getting ready for disrupting the world with the help of this data and technology. Many years back, it used to be very difficult for us. Because we will say, oh, I'm not trained for that. My college is not teaching me this, that. This algorithm is not known to me. This book is not available to me. This journal is not accessible for me in my college. All of them have disappeared today. We all have, so when we are all PhD students, it takes three, four years for us to get the latest journals. Because all printed copies coming, shipped from somewhere, 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 etc. So there is nothing like that today. You get it, papers, before it gets published freely on the web. You, you come to know the latest research everywhere very easily. So you have all the open source uh, code available today. All the collabs and other people are going to give you the hardware, computing facilities if you, don't, if you cannot afford to do it today. This is time for you to work on our local problems and create disruptions and advances in the country. We are at the right time and I look forward for all of you to be part of this. Thank you. So I invite the chief guest to speak. Thank you very much, sir. Respected Professor Raju, the faculty and the leadership here at IIIT, Professor Deva, Professor Jawahar, and students. First of all, I would like to sort of place on record my thanks for having invited me here and giving me this opportunity to share my two cents. Over the last 30 years, I have been evangelizing healthcare, and that's possibly the only thing that I know that I can talk about. Uh, and I'm really going to take a cue from you, Dr. Jawahar, in terms of how you actually ran the session. So this is going to be a sort of an interactive session. I'm not going to let you guys be at peace with yourself, OK? Trust me. 1978, 230 countries came together to pledge for having primary care available to all its citizens by 2000. 22 years have gone by, 40 years from the time the pledge was taken, and we are nowhere even close to it. Right? Now, let me turn it around and ask you a few questions, guys. Why is this data science, why is this AI so important for healthcare? we will derive out of the answers that you actually give me. What is the world population today? How much? Eight billion. Eight billion. Okay. How many of them are over the age of 65, the senior citizens? Take a stab. Take a stab. It's 1.3 billion. How many people out of this 8 billion will have cancer in their lifetime? Given all the good stuff that we have had, eating, packaged food, 
sedentary lifestyle, all of the good thing, drinking, all of the things that is happening, what do you think is the ratio that is expected to be in the world? It's one in three. How many people are going to be diabetic in this world? Take a shot. One in six. How many people are having respiratory problems in this world today? 500 million. How many people are having hypertension problems? 1 billion. Okay? How much of money is America spending as a percentage of GDP on its healthcare system? 18%. How much is Japan spending on its own system given the fact that there is a double whammy there in terms of decreasing birth rate and en enhanced longevity? 16%. Now, if you look at all of this, you will find that the problems that we are having are massive. Any amount of investment in access, in infrastructure, is not going to be sufficient to solve the problems that we are looking at. We need to look at exponential solu solutions for this. Now, take the case of India and other emerging world. What are the three challenges that we have? It is cost, quality, and access of care. If we look at the number of radiologists that are available in India, it is one-fifth of what is, five times short of what is needed. We know that intensivist, in an ICU, intensivist manages care, right? Do you know for a population of 1.3 billion in India, how many qualified intensivists we have? Take a guess now. What is it? How much? Number of doctors managing intensive care, qualified doctors managing intensive care in India for 1.3 billion population. I want an answer, guys. Otherwise, I am not moving forward. 1 is to 5, or 5 is to 1. 1 is to 5. The answer is 500. Okay? Indonesia, 280 million people. You know the amount of intensivist in Indonesia has? It's 50. Now, when you are looking at these sort of problems, you will find that any amount of investment in infrastructure is not going to take you to where it ought to be. It is going to be in terms of technologies. And that's the need, and that's where AI and ML and what have you, the upcoming technologies, have a significant role to play in dispensation of care. Now, what is an exponential technology? Exponential technologies are those for which the input is small, but the output is massive. You walk across the room, you take 30 linear steps. You go from possibly one point of here to the other end of the room, right? If those were to be 30 exponential steps, I would have walked the distance from here to moon 26 times. Do the calculation and check it out, it works. Now, that's the type of technology that we need. Now, to draw an analogy to what Professor Jawahar said in terms of, let me sort of take that to a real life world. We started, you know what a CT is, right? It's basically a scanning system. We first started with 8 slice CT, then we went to 16 slice, then we went to 32, 64, 128, and Toshiba brought in a 256 slice CT. And everybody, hey, ha 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 ha, it's a big one. It's like having a 50G, 50 MB megapixel camera with me. But at, that, at some point in time, this race for Advancement in hardware has stopped. Nobody cares what the hardware is because be it Siemens, be it GE, be it Philips, anybody else, the actual inferencing that happens is from the image that comes out. And that image quality is almost the same for any of these devices. The question that comes up is how do I, in, what do I infer from that image and how do I draw, shall I say, inferences which will help me treat the patient better. And that again is all about data and data manipulation. 
we had another problem in hand saying the customer requirement was take MR as a case in point. A standard MR, if you were to do a brain scan, it takes you about 40 minutes. Doctors came and told us saying that 40 minutes is not sufficient, we need to do it in 20 minutes. So what do you do? You've got two options there. Either I accelerate the hardware or bring in software techniques which will ensure that I am able to reduce this time. If I were to take hardware, it's going to take me millions of dollars of investment and time to make it. So what did we went the easier route? We said, let's do it software. So what I will do is, instead of scanning it for 40 minutes, I will do it for 20 minutes only, and for the balance 20 loss, I will, I will recompensate it by algorithms that will get it back to where it was. So effectively, what you get is the same quality of image in 20 minutes, which again is tantamount to data processing, which, which only means to saying that at some point in time in the future, the devices are going to become agnostic. It doesn't really matter whose device you use. The power is in the data. The power is in the inferencing. And that's where you guys come and play a role. Let's, let's take another example. Let's take, for example, maternal care. India has a, has a death rate that is, uh, for every 100,000 births, what are, the, um, uh, what are the number of children that we lose? India is at 53. Sub-Saharan Africa is at some, something like 250. Japan is at 1.8. Can we use simple techniques? Can we use predictions by monitoring the, para the normal parameters of a mother post-conception? And can we sort of manage neonatal rates? The answer is yes. Did we do it? Yes. Indonesia, we brought it down to zero by driving certain interventions from home, absolutely basic interventions. And that's the power of data if you were to have all of it with you in the right form, in the right manner, because most times, as again, what Professor Johar said, data, uh, what you get to see is a bunch of data. The question is, is there something that I can draw an inference from? Is there something that I can make a meaningful use out of it? And that's where you call, start looking at structured data. So uh, all in all, I would possibly it, it suffices to say that the future of healthcare, at least for sure, is dependent on the way that we take data, interpret it, and also draw conclusions from, shall I say, from a multimodal perspective. Like, there was an analysis done saying, by taking a camera shot of your retina, if the neurons in the retina are affected and there are similar neurons in kidney, the chance of uh, a collateral damage in kidney cannot be ruled out. Now, that's the type of inferencing that we need to bring to the table. And that is the ask, my friends. There is so much to do in healthcare. The problems that we are dealing with is so, so huge that conventional methods will not help us. And that's where I really look up to this generation to stand in and see what you can do to collaborate with the hospitals, collaborate with the clinicians to come up with solutions that will take mankind to the next level and make all of us feel safe. Once again, thank you so much for sharing this, for giving me an opportunity to share, and looking forward to teaming up with you guys. Thanks. Inaugural uh, session. Uh, I thank all the speakers uh, for uh, enlightening us with this uh, new words of wisdom. And uh, we hope to see more such uh, interesting sessions in future. Thank you, Professor Jawar. Thank you, Professor Deva. Thank you, Dr. Javi Ramsam. We'll break for uh, its tea and